Uh, our first speaker this morning, he has like the best voice I have ever heard in my entire life. I kind of want to kidnap him so he'll just read to me all the time, but that's illegal. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Seth Andrews. Hang on just a second. I'm going to make the world fit here. How many of you stayed at the hotel last night? I actually had this thought. When I turned on the tap water, I actually had the thought, because you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Like, we got first world problems, right? <laughs> like, I didn't have hot water. I was shaving this morning and I thought, I hope the bleeding stops before nine o'clock this morning as I'm up here. It is an honor to be here, to have been part of this uh, amazing event. It's my very first Skepticon and I just couldn't be more excited. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for the, for the honor and the privilege. Um, for those who don't know who I am, um, I'm a former Christian radio guy, a product of a very fundamentalist Christian home, Christian school, spokesperson for Youth for Christ, Christian broadcaster, in, uh, starting in 1990 until about 2002. And so I came late to the skeptic party, but I did arrive, and it's good to be here. And I now um, try to use my abilities as a broadcaster, producer, and storyteller to go out and speak out against the falsehoods that were sort of drilled into me and those like me from my earliest memories. And so uh, we've got our weekly radio podcast. Um, and thank you. How many of you are podcast listeners? Can I see? Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I, um, please don't receive this as bragging. This is more like I am, I am so excited. Uh, we are on track this month to have 700,000 monthly downloads, and we may hit a million by spring. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It just, it's one of my favorite parts of the week, and, so, and it wouldn't be there if it wasn't for you. I find myself often frustrated because I am trying to help other people I'm trying to deliver what we, Dr. Peter Bogosian on the radio a few weeks ago called micro-inoculations to the faith virus, right? And so you and I are out there having conversations with theists and deists and we're having this. And I find myself, honestly, and this is just the human part of me, frustrated because science gives us something new every day, but religion has been giving us the same stuff over and over. And I'm having the same arguments over and over and over and over and over. Anybody feel that frustration? like? Come on. Well, I'm a radio guy. And it's like playing a song on the radio that once was interesting. You think, wow, that's interesting. And then what does corporate radio do? They play it so often that you hate it. Right? It comes on, click. I present for you today the greatest hits of theist arguments. Q102 FM, 70 degrees on our way to a high of 82. Chance of showers by the weekend, and coming up next, it is facepalm. <laughs> it's Ken Ham, my granddaddy wasn't no monkey. <laughs> Evolution, it's just a theory. The god of the gaps. It takes more faith to be an atheist. Teach the controversy. You were never a true Christian to begin with. You took it out of context. I had a personal experience. You're just angry. Better safe than sorry, Pascal's wager. There's little blaze up there. Hey, how did something come from nothing? The human eye is too complex to have evolved. Scientist X believes in God. Here's his book. Read this. Anybody have that happen? Come on. You got to own it. Okay. 
The Bible tells me so, using the Bible to prove the Bible, which is much like using Harry Potter to prove Harry Potter. All belief systems deserve respect. America was founded as a Christian nation. Hey, they found Noah's Ark, again. <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes. Hey, if it's not true, how come it's been around for thousands and thousands of years and there are so many copies of it? Ignore the Old Testament, read the New Testament. Where do you get your morals from? With a special bonus track, Hitler. <laughs> You've killed God because you want to be gods. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. Charles Darwin gave his heart to Jesus on his deathbed. I had an out-of-body or near-death experience. I traveled to heaven and saw the pearly gates. There are no transitional fossils. Prove he doesn't exist. Why are you stealing my joy? <laughs> For someone who doesn't believe in God, you people sure talk about him an awful lot. I think you've got a guilty conscience. I think it's the Holy Spirit that's tapping on your heart, and you need to obey, don't you? And you've got to help me out with this one. You may not believe in him, but he... They call these credible arguments for God. You and I call them a weapons-grade facepalm. How does this happen? Well, when I was a young person, I was fitted with God glasses. And God glasses, these rose-colored glasses through which you see the world, have blinders on each side. And we are trained from an early age to keep our field of vision narrow. And this was a point of pride. Anybody know what this is? Right? It's the answer to the ultimate question about life the universe and everything. Any Douglas Adams fans in the room? Oh yeah. The rest of you, shame on you. What are you doing? You go read you some Hitchhiker's Guide as soon as you can. The guy was a genius. You guys know the story, right? They build the computer deep thought to bring us the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. But of course they have to go back and and because the answer to them makes no sense, they have to find out, well, what is the ultimate question? And that's the hook that I'm using this morning. What is the ultimate question? And I'll come back to it. We were taught in the church to worship God. We were also taught to worship ignorance, right? Does she have any idea what is in that book? Does she have the maturity, the wisdom, the life experience to properly understand what she might be told is in that book. And yet, she holds it to her chest, and if somebody was to ask her, even at that young age, is the Bible absolutely true, she would say, yes. And her parents would beam with pride. Does Jesus love you? Yes. Who loves you with all of his heart? Jesus who came to earth to die for your sins, Jesus. Welcome to the pile, the, uh, the power of childhood indoctrination. And the Bible tells us, don't look up anywhere else, but to God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Second Corinthians says, as we look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Creation Ministries just says it outright. By definition, no apparent perceived or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. If it's not in the Bible, no matter what it is, we throw it out. How many of you have encountered someone that said, I don't care what evidence you tell me, I'll never give up my faith? They're outside on the sidewalk. <laughs> Can I speak to them for just a second? Let me speak about this. I had a thought yesterday when I came by and saw them up with their placards. And being a product of the church, I know how they think. They're not here for us. Right, there's never been one instance that, I can, I, that I've ever heard of where somebody walked in to a place with a placard that said, repent for the day is at hand, and an atheist immediately said, you know, and right, did a 180 and walked out and dropped to his knees and said the salvation prayer. 
And they don't have that expectation, right? They're not here for us. They are here so that on Sunday they can go back and say, yep, we went out on Saturday. We went out and did battle with the devil. Good work, everybody. Good work. Good work, right? They're patting themselves on the back and congratulating themselves for being soldiers in God's army. You know, this isn't about conversion. This is about affirmation. These people might uh, look at the white hot candle of science and say, hit it with your Bible. Now, here's a great example of how the church teaches people, especially young people, to worship ignorance. Anybody know who Joyce Meyer is? She's a millionaire author and evangelist in that order. And she has written a, a book called Battlefield of the Mind for Teens. Now, Dale McGowan brought this to my attention, and I, I told him I was going to use it in the speech. Um, she wrote a book, and it's for teens and for the parents of teens. And she said this. Satan will look for your child's weakest area, an attack at that point. He will attempt to fill your child with worry, reasoning, fear, depression, and discouraging negative thoughts. This is how the church approaches reason. She lumped it in with worry, fear, depression, and negativity. It gets better. Watch this. I once asked the Lord why so many people are confused, and he said to me, tell them to stop trying to figure everything out, and they will stop being confused. I found it to be absolutely true. Reasoning and confusion go together. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Joyce Meyer, but if you're going to preach a literal Bible, I have to bring to your attention that you do not have the authority to tell me anything. How, how, do, how does any woman support and endorse and promote that book? It's a misogynistic nightmare. How is Beth Moore and jo Joyce Meyer and, I mean, it just boggles the mind. Well, it's ignorance and it's often fueled by fear. Fear of anything secular. For example, here is a sinister agent with designs on the souls of your children. He's evil incarnate. He is Bill Nye. Yeah. Yeah, you can sense it, can't you? You can feel the evil. In August of uh, last year, Bill Nye told, uh, said on a big think video that was released online, this. He said, evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science, in all of biology. It's like, it's very much analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. Well, that couldn't go unchallenged, so Ken Ham weighed in and he said this. Bill Nye, who is really the humanist guy, is out to get kids and brainwash them into secularism and atheism. We need to do all we can to capture these kids for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Bill Nye's the guy indoctrinating kids. <laughs> Here is how prevalent this kind of fear of secularism is interwoven into our culture in ways many people do not even think about. Dictionary.com is one of the most widely used online dictionaries in the English-speaking world. If you go and look up the word godless, one of the definitions for godless is wicked and evil. If you have no God, you're wicked and evil. And so we look up, right? Always looking up. Don't pay too much attention down here. Don't pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, right? Keep looking up. I agree with Dawkins. I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. It's the reason you and I continue to have to tell people that the Shroud of Turin is not proof that Jesus was alive, right? It was debunked, soundly debunked. It's the reason we have to tell people that the Grand Canyon wasn't created 4,000 years ago in five minutes by a global water event. It's the reason we have to tell people that we aren't a Christian nation. It's the reason we have to tell people that that is a mound of dirt <laughs> and not a floating zoo that has been waiting for us to discover it. 
It's the reason that schools like the school in Louisiana, private Christian school, is teaching in their science book that dinosaurs and human beings coexisted. This is one of the main idea create young earth creationist arguments. Well, you know, actually we did coexist with dinosaurs and they used the Loch Ness Monster as an example. They are teaching that the Loch Ness Monster has been sighted by a small submarine and quite possibly is a plesiosaur. They're teaching this to these young skulls in Louisiana. It's the reason places like the Creation Museum exist. Have you guys, any, who's been to the Creation Museum? I'm still a little bit dead inside. <laughs> the rest of you, go online to YouTube and look for my video called Atheists at the Creation Museum. Last year, I grabbed a group of infidels in Kentucky and I took a camera and we toured the whole thing and I did a video on it. It's 12 minutes long and it's, Ken Ham's House of Horrors. It is absolutely, it's, it's nonstop guilt. Blames us for everything, from gang violence to the Nazis to disease. I mean, it's just horrible. It's just horrible. But I had to, I can't, don't have time to show you the whole video, but I had to show you this clip from the video, all right? This is what you're looking at when you pay. What's the admission price? 20 something bucks a head to get in that sucker. Here's the kind of thing you will see. Here's Adam in the garden, tropical garden with his lamb. Do you see it? and his penguin <laughs> and his vegetarian dinosaur. After all, the dinosaurs only developed the taste for blood after the fall of humankind. Before that, they were happy, clappy vegetarians. In fact, did you see the one article a few years back from the Creation Museum worker who explained that the long incisor teeth were used to crack coconuts? <laughs> it's the reason we have to put up with this stuff on Facebook every day. Have you guys seen this? How can you look at this and not know that the hand of God is not protecting us all? It's not even a good Photoshop job. Here's the original photograph, by the way. It's the same reason people can claim that God helps Tim Tebow score touchdowns while 30,000 people starve to death around the planet every single day. It's the same reason. <laughs> I did this speech with David Silverman in the audience in Pennsylvania, and I almost brought him on stage to do that look. <laughs> that look, the, you know, the one he did on O'Reilly that's become the meme. Stephen Prothero has written a book called Religious Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't. And they surveyed religious and non-religious people alike to find out, all right, maybe they're ignorant about the world. How much do they really know about their own Bible? The Bible they claim is truth, is absolute fact. Let's find out. And so they surveyed. I think the survey was over 1,000 people, both religious and non-religious. And the results were fascinating. Did you know that 60% of Americans can't name even five of the Ten Commandments? The most important rules ever given to humankind. The majority of Americans can't name even half of them. Only one third of the people polled could name who gave the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> one third. Seventy-five percent say the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. It appears nowhere in Scripture. 50% of high school seniors think Sodom and Gomorrah are married. Ten percent of people surveyed think that Noah's wife is Joan of Arc. If I can borrow a a phrase from our next speaker and a dear friend of mine, Aaron Ra, he said it best, ignorance is not just what you don't know, it's also what you won't know. Now, I think it's hugely tasteless to shill for your own merchandise table when you're on stage, and I would never think of doing that. <laughs> and I want to just say how much I feel that's inappropriate. No. Um, if I may, though, I, I reference in the book that I've, I've written called Deconverted, an encounter I had with a mother and father, and, and those of you who have strained relationships with religious parents can probably relate, where there's an undercurrent of 
sadness and disappointment and shame and grief in everything that you do, even the most harmless of conversations, you can tell that they feel they failed, you fell, failed, it's a black eye on the family. And we finally got a chance, this was a couple of years ago, we went to lunch and we had a whole lunch where we didn't talk about religion, we didn't argue, it was good. Man, it was good, we got to be a family. And then as we were walking in the parking lot to the car, my mom said, hey, come up to the car real quick, I got something for you, I wanna give you a book. And I had what they call an oh shit moment, right? Oh shit. And the book she gave me was Alistair McGrath's The Dawkins Delusion. Now, I'm like, fine, fine. What's the gist of the book? What's, his, what's he trying to say? And she said, well, I, I, don't, I haven't read it. I didn't read it, but, uh, but I think it'll be good for you. Now, it was enough for her that it was anti-Dawkins. This is how the religious approach a great many things. We know what's on the cover. We sure don't know much about what's inside. Here's another aspect of religion I want to hit on. I did a radio show a few months ago with the guy who was my Christian radio boss back in the 90s at KXOJ 100.9 FM. He found out I was an atheist. He found out I had a successful podcast. And he begged me for the chance to come on the air and give us a perspective on God that we had not heard. <laughs> oh. Okay, so he came on the show. And for those of you who made it through those two hours, your purple heart is at a table in the lobby. <laughs> it was a slog, it was pretty tough, because it was essentially, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. But he had a perspective on God that's indicative of how many people in the church are programmed to think. And it's audio only, but let me play for you this soundbite. Here's my belief. Uh, you know, you are what you are at your worst moment. You can't judge me at, at, at what I am at my best. Because my true condition is always going to be what I am at my worst. And here's what I am at my worst. I'm arrogant. I'm unbecoming. I'm unlovable. I'm self-centered. I'm greedy. I'm all the very things that I don't want to be. But yet, here's the deal. I get up every day and I look at myself in the mirror and I go, I don't have any, I've got the desire to be different, but I don't have any power. I'm powerless. I'm not worthy, I can't, there's no way I could do it without him. The adversity in my life is only to make me better, it's, it's good for me. He knows what's best for me. I just can't leave him. What does that sound like to you? Battered spouse, battered partner, the bride of Christ. And the Bible tells us there is no one righteous, no one, not even one. I did a video a few months ago that was a twist on intelligent design. Every time I meet somebody and they see a beautiful mountain vista or a beautiful rainbow or the birth of a beautiful child, they always get misty-eyed and they say, how can you look at that and not just know that there was a designer? And of course, uh, I thought, all right, fine. So I produced a video that tackled intelligent design with some of the not so palatable aspects of design, tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, birth defects, disease, famine, um, you know, parasitic insects that drill their way into a live host and eat their way out. I mean, it, just all these macabre scenarios. I thought, fine, if we're gonna talk about the happy joy joy stuff, let's talk about design in all of its forms. And uh, so I posted, and you can find the video on YouTube. It runs about six minutes. It's called Intelligent Design. Well, there's a guy named Faz Rana. He runs a website called Reasons to Believe. He has a PhD in biochemistry, and yet somehow he is a Christian. And he produced a response video to my video explaining how this thing kind of stuff could happen, these horrible things and why it makes sense in the construct of design. If you want life on a planet, you have to have tectonic activity. No tectonic activity, no life. To have a planet without earthquakes would be to have a planet without life. And it's important to note along these lines that a recent study done by two engineers published in Nature demonstrates that over 83% of the deaths that result from earthquakes in the last three decades has been directly attributable to government corruption. That is, that it's due to moral failing on the part of humanity, not, uh, not due to the nature of the world that we live in. Earthquakes are caused by our moral failing. 
I'm reminded of the quote that says, birds born in a cage think flying is an illness. I'm an Oklahoman, born and raised. On May the 23rd of this year, we had a horrific disaster happen. It was an EFI twister that destroyed the town of Moore, Oklahoma. It was horrible. We had the TV plugged in, we were watching it from down the turnpike, and we were watching it happen. It was horrible. Moore's just had it really bad. They've been hit three times in the last 15 years. Here's a uh, shot of the damage path, back to back, side by side rather, from 1999 to 2013. You can see the twister just ground all the way through the city and devastated it. Here's Moore Medical Center, or what's left of it. Now, people are looking for hope. It is in these times when we look to the sky and we are looking for coping, ways to deal. I understand it. I understand why we paint God into these things. Because certainly somebody up there is in control. In the wake of this horrible disaster, 45 dead, including women and children, no, it was horrible. There's an article on the Christian Post that the Bible found in OK Tornado Debris open to Isaiah 32.2, providing hope for many. The Washington Post put a deal out that said, Bible pages found in Oklahoma, tornado debris seen as sign of hope in storm. Now let's look at this. This is Plaza Towers Elementary School. There were children inside the school at the end of a school day as the twister came toward them. There was nowhere to go. There was no storm shelter. And seven of these children in the basement drowned. But Danny Moody found these pages on the windshield of his pickup truck and proclaims to the world, my God still delivers. God saved a few pieces of paper, but he allowed the horrible drowning deaths of seven children and the violent deaths in many ways of over 40. There was one lady who was driving in the car with her infant and the Vortex came and, and sucked them both out of the driver's side window and, and killed them both. And their family was in a vehicle behind and saw the whole thing happen. It was horrible. But God rescued, what, a, f a few pages from his book? And the signs go up everywhere. God bless more. Pray for Oklahoma. Second Samuel 22 tells us, In my distress I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried out to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry reached his ears. Really? Really? Our own governor went on national television and asked for prayers. The hashtag pray for Oklahoma became one of the most popular hashtags on Twitter. Retweeted even by our own president. Our prayers are with the people of Oklahoma today. Pray for Oklahoma. Beyonce, Rihanna, Katy Perry, Carrie Underwood, Alicia Keys, and celebrities from all over the globe send prayers to Oklahoma. Ricky Gervais said, I feel like an idiot now. I only sent money. And to his credit, rather than just draw attention to the problem, he decided to be part of the solution. He put up the hashtag, actually do something for Oklahoma. <laughs> and he suggested that his millions of followers donate to the American Red Cross, do something. But look at us, as believers, we would look up and say, for our light and momentary troubles, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know, thank God there wasn't $5 billion in damage instead of just two. Praise Jesus. Thank God there weren't 14 children drowned in Plaza Towers Elementary School instead of just seven. Thank God there weren't two mothers and their babies sucked out of a driver's side window. Praise Jesus. They look up at the sky and they just remind themselves that it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan. Ignorance quite often fueled by fear. Fear of hell, fear of the unknown. They've been trained to fear science. They've been trained to fear questions, curiosity. Doubt is the enemy, doubt is the devil. I want to give you another example of how fear is used, and this is another clip from the radio show with my former boss, David Stevens of KXOJ Radio. Now, he told me on the air that he was convinced that I was still secretly a believer. 
okay? And he was going to prove it to me, and this is what he said. Okay, this is what I want you to do. This is, this is, this is how you can prove this to me, okay? Because I think you do. I think you do, and I think you have some doubts about it, and here's how you can undeniably prove it to me. I, I, I got on your website, um, before, you know, before we, we got on earlier today, and I think you've got, are you going to Colorado? Yeah, I'll be there on Saturday. For, uh, okay, here's what I want you to do on Saturday. How many people will be there? A few hundred. What do you think? 200. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get down on your knees, and I want you to invite Satan to come into your life. That's what I want. You. I want you to. I want you to go. You know what, Satan? If you're out there, you know I don't. I don't even know if you're out there, but I want. There's nothing that I want more than you. If you exist, I want you to come into my life, and I want you to have every part of me. All right. <laughs> How many of you from religious cultures, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, felt a chill at the thought of inviting Satan into this room? You've been programmed that heavily that it still eats at you from time to time. Okay. Well, I've got two problems. The first thing is my days of bowing down are over, right? They're over. There is one person who governs my life. Me. Me. One person who governs your life. You. So it would not be truthful for me to say, I want you to come in and be the Lord of my life, because absolutely not. There is one person who governs my actions who takes responsibility for me, and that's me, period. But I think because we are scientists in our own little circles, I believe in being thorough. So I've developed a plea, a petition to the Dark Lord, and in front of all of you, a host of witnesses, I will call down Beelzebub now. <laughs> Dear Satan, I am the Lord of my own life. I don't believe in devils, demons, or hell. In fact, I feel a bit ridiculous talking to a character I feel as real and threatening as Lord Voldemort. <laughs> but as a proponent of science, I believe in being thorough. So if you exist, in this host of 200 witnesses, I offer myself as a vessel for you to prove your power. Enter my heart, my body, my soul, or whatever is necessary for proper and unambiguous manifestation. And may my own eternal damnation provide the opportunity for the rescue of others. You guys feel anything? <laughs> right? It's the monster in the closet. And you and I are not children anymore. This is a mechanism for control. Make people afraid to ask questions and see the world as it is, lest the Dark Lord take them down to hell forever. It's funny, when I did this prayer a few cities ago, some people got pissed off because I added this. I said, hey, as long as you're coming, could you bring me a cherry cheese Danish <laughs> and an espresso? <laughs> Took me a couple of years to get over my fear of hell. Like, what if I get this wrong kind of a fear? But now I see it for what it is, right? If somebody threatens you with hell, you know it's desperate. You know they can't beat you with the facts. They can't beat you with the evidence, so now, well, you don't want to go to hell, do you? Or the hugely convincing argument, well, just in case, you just be, all, just, you know, be a believer just in case. Yeah, that's true conviction right there. Carl Sagan once said, avoidable human misery is more often caused not so much by stupidity as by ignorance, particularly in our own ignorance about ourselves. We're afraid to ask the ultimate question. What is the ultimate question? Well, I'm going to cheat. Because I believe the ultimate question is different for all of us. I think it is the question that sets us free. 
Whatever that question is that we were forbidden to ask, the question that starts us on the road to reality, the question that helps us to break the bonds of dogma and superstition, whatever that liberating moment was when you finally said, I'm going to ask this without fear and I'm going to find the answer. That's for you, the ultimate question. I believe the ultimate question is asked without or in spite of fear. It's more interested in facts than comfort. It's designed for knowledge over belief. It includes the whole of humanity and not just segregated portions of it. It won't allow the answer to be a cheat. It's not afraid to hear, we don't know yet. It's asking a voice that's prepared to speak alone against a roaring mob or a deafening silence. And it represents curiosity, passionate curiosity, defiant curiosity about the things that we are told we are not supposed to know. On a plane toward the Colorado uh, Secular Conference, I just had this, people ask me what my role is in the movement. I, I'm still trying to figure it out, right? I think we're all doing what we do. I'm not a great thinker. I'm not a, you know, the thinking atheist is not a person. I'm certainly not the thinking atheist. I'm the dumbass who took 30 years to figure out that donkeys couldn't talk, right? <laughs> but you and I come from a culture where they, when we ask these ultimate questions, people start to tell us, look, you're thinking way too much on this, right? Right? Go with the spirit. You need to go with your heart. You need to take it on. Now, I want to create an environment where we said, no, let's think about this, whatever it is. We can all be thinkers in our own circle. And um, I also wanted to encourage people that it's okay to speak in your own voice. It's okay. And so as I was on the, uh, on the airplane, I wrote a letter and read it before the uh, Colorado Secular Conference, and I, I take this letter with me everywhere I go. And you, with your permission, I'd like to just read it for you tonight. It takes about five minutes. Um, but it's, it's the thought I want to leave you with today. And uh, so if you'll indulge me, I'll just read it word for word, okay? It goes like this. You learn a lot about people when you declare that you're not going to live your life by their rules. And many in this room know well the consequences of doing so, something so shocking as to be an individual, a singular voice, an often inquisitive voice with its own tenor, its own style, its own song, its own message. Only raise your hand if you're comfortable, but how many of you have experienced a kind of personal or professional consequence for your non-belief? Okay. We live in a world where conformity is comfort, and we all know well how comfortable people can become. So many voices out there are merely an echo, a hand-me-down from a previous generation, and the generation before, and the generation before. Breaking that cycle is unthinkable. And why would they ever consider it, as the cloak they inherited feels so warm and safe? Everyone around them looks like them, walks like them, talks like them, everyone except for you. They not in agreement, you raise an eyebrow of doubt. They just know the answer. You just know the answer raises many more questions. They take security in staying on the narrow path. You take security in carving a path of your own. But this is not what was expected of you. They laid out the guidelines for what a proper person should do, and they would make sure you turned out right no matter what. So what happened? At this very moment, mothers and fathers carry embarrassment and shame that they failed as a parent because you left the straight and narrow. You were co-opted and corrupted because you rewrote the playbook in a language that they consider to be foreign, confusing, and ugly. You had two choices, right? You could either keep the peace and line up with the others, or you could walk at your own pace in your own direction for your own reasons and accept the consequences and rewards that come with being your own person. And the fallout for many of you has been significant. These days when they look at you, they only see what they think you should have been, what you could have been, if only you'd done things their way. They speak the words of love, but just barely just barely, and by lacing it with distance and disdain, they cheapen the word. In fact, every time they look at you and say, I love you, you get this bitter taste like you've just been schmoozed by a politician whose only real concern is trying to change your vote. You know the feeling? 
Yeah, they love you, but the full package, the 100% love, the unfiltered love, well, that's kept on reserve until you straighten up, you fit in, you conform, and stop making waves. Not until you start acting normal. Well, for just a second, let's take a look at normal, shall we? Normal is a husband and wife married per the Bible, in a church and under God, condemning non-heterosexuals for ignoring and even desecrating the lawful and ordained marital union that they now enjoy after two divorces. It's a mother telling a daughter that sex is dirty and that her body is dirty, that sexual desire is harmful lust, and that she's cursed by the fall of Eve in the garden a byproduct of sin designed to gain her worth from a future husband who, according to the book of Genesis, will rule over her. It's a teacher frightening a six-year-old child with torture and a fiery hell and a devil lurking in the shadows with designs on its very soul. It's refusing to purchase a new car without first test driving 15 vehicles from six different car lots, checking the vehicle history, the payments, the insurance safety record, and rating and consumer reports, while accepting the Bible as absolute fact without even knowing who wrote the book of Genesis. It's a church communion ritual where the men, women, and children gather to symbolically eat flesh and drink blood. It's thanking God for food grown and prepared by human hands. It's giving God the glory for providing that new car that came with a five-year payment book. It's praying for safety after buckling your seatbelt, locking your doors, and loading your handgun. It's praying for healing after you call 911. It's Sunday school songs, a Bible on the nightstand, a check in the offering plate, an evangelist on the television, a Jesus fish on your car, and a t-shirt that says, seven days without Jesus makes one week. It's a prison disguised to look like a mansion. And you aren't going to live like that. And you've made that pledge. You've read the books and seen the history and learned the science and realized that the world was much, much grander than most people ever imagined. You finally found your own voice and you are going to speak with it. You've had the epiphany that you don't owe it to the rest of the world to keep them happy. You owe it to you to create happiness for yourself. And even though wherever and whenever you can, you say the words and take the actions that build bridges and soften the sharp edges and demonstrate a love for people and a desire for a better world, you are not a sheep to be led, an echo to be repeated, a cautionary tale, a bad example, a pervert, a freak, shameful, broken, ugly. You're not ugly. You're beautiful. You have figured out what so many billions of others have missed. That this life is just too precious to spend in someone else's shadow. That by judging everyone and everything that's different, you only indict your own shallow heart and you cheat yourself out of amazing depth, breadth, color, culture, and humanity out there that's so much more wonderful than the tiny rooms people lock themselves into and the narrow tunnels they walk. That believing in things without evidence, faith, is not a virtue but something to be pitied. That sexuality isn't shameful but something to be celebrated. That the condemnation of what is wrong, even when it is called sacred, is an obligation of any moral creature. And that your hopes, dreams, desires, loves, pursuits, and passions belong to you and you alone. You've stepped out of the crowd to stand forward, to stand out, and to stand your ground. To know that even though you occupy a tiny speck, upon a tiny speck, inside this vast universe, and even though you don't believe your father's a divine king and your mission's written in a magic book and your home is in the heavens, your life is wonderful and amazing and precious and full of love and so much more satisfying. It's a life where every day brings a new opportunity to ask the ultimate question. Now, is that kind of life easy? Nah. Is it popular? Probably not. But be encouraged, my friends. Because inside this 13.7 billion year old universe, there has never, never been anyone exactly like you, and there will never be again. 
and you're simply living a life that honestly reflects that fact. And while others laugh at you because you are different, you can laugh at them because they are all the same. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.